Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for attending uh, today's webinar on stipulated sum and liquidated damages. What are they? Are they enforceable? And how do you beat them? My name is Jennifer Budd. I'm an associate at Coincite Leas. I have been at the firm for eight years um, and I have done practice construction litigation for my entire legal career. Um, prior to being at the firm, I worked as a deputy attorney general uh, in New Jersey representing the Department of Transportation in their construction disputes, bid protests, things like that. Um, so um, as we go today, if you have any questions, we definitely want to address them. Just type them into the questions box um, and I'll probably do them at the end. I'll try and catch them as I go, but if I don't, I'll certainly circle back at the end and be glad to, to answer any questions um, that you have on the topic. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, stipulated sum contract provisions, what are they? Um, I'm also going to look at, we're gonna look at some types. The most common in the construction industry is, is obviously liquidated damages for delay um, when a project finishes late, but there's other types of liquidated damages or stipulated sum provisions, and we'll go a couple go through a couple of those. Um, we'll also talk about how to defend an LD claim uh, based on delay, and then some specific delay issues that have arisen in light of the current pandemic. Okay, so to begin, what are stipulated sum provisions? So, and I'm gonna say stipulated sum, but that is also interchangeable with liquidated damage. I'm gonna try and say stipulated sum because in the construction industry, everybody thinks about liquidated damages as only being something that happens if a project finishes late, but it can be more general. So just to prevent confusion, I'll try and say stipulated sum, but it is interchangeable with liquidated damage. So the idea is that, um, the parties are free to enter into contracts that contain provisions that apportion damages in the event of a breach or a default. Um, and they may agree to a particular measure of damage. Uh, so it's at the time the parties into a contract, they essentially agree on what the monetary measure of that damage is. They're saying if this event occurs, then we're gonna measure the damage because of that event as X. And it's, it's gonna be some sort of monetary measure. So why, why are stipulated sum provisions used? Um, they're used to avoid the uncertainty, delay, the cost um, of trying to prove damages. Um, litigation slow. Even if you're in arbitration, it can still be very expensive and, and timely. Um, and to prove damages, it, it, it can take a lot of, of evidence. Uh, you generally need a lot of documentation, accounting reports, payroll reports, invoices. You're going to need somebody to testify about all of those documents. So by taking the measure, agreeing ahead of time to the measure of damage, you've taken out some of that proof requirement. Um, and if you think about it this way, if somebody is going to go to court on a breach of contract, they're going to have to prove two things that there was a breach of the contract and they're gonna have to prove then what was the damage caused by that. So the liquidated damage deals with that second issue. It kind of already wraps it up. So all, all I'd have to prove is that you committed that breach and then we already know how to calculate the damage. So that's the, the idea behind it and that's why they're used. It also gives parties control. It allows them to know what they're getting into ahead of time so that they can apportion the risk and then appreciate that risk. So are these clauses enforceable? Yes, they are, um, but it's complicated. And we're gonna go through some of the things that have made that complicated. So why do construction owners like LDs? They compel performance, right? Um, especially in it, it makes sure the contractor stays on schedule. Um, again, to the reason we just talked about, it makes it a little bit easier if you actually have a dispute because you already can measure the damage. Um, and, and I think some, some people think that if, if it'll, be, it'll be a little bit of a punishment if there's a delay. Um, it'll, it'll extract some harm um, and, and some pain that, will, that, that people will want to uh, prevent. Um, so that means that they're more likely to perform in accordance with the contract. 
Um, so these are kind of the things that you you see in case law, and 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 you you can, you've certainly heard and seen in letters um, on projects and things like that. Now, interestingly, only one of these is actually a proper motivation to include a stipulated sum in a contract. So which one is that? Um, it's two. So if you're thinking to yourself, it's two, it's correct. Um, only the really the only motivation is that is proper is because the damages are complex or difficult to prove, and the parties have decided that they will uh, reasonably forecast what those damages are by agreeing to an amount in the contract. Um, now, the other motivations, number one and two, one and three, we see all the time. And as you go through, we go through this presentation, we'll, we'll see why those are not um, permissible under the law. So the reason why, uh, so, so the, this is kind of two sides of the same coin. Liquidated damages are absolutely enforceable. But the other side of that is that a liquidated damage, if used incorrectly or written incorrectly, um, is unenforceable because it's deemed a penalty. So although liquidated damages are enforceable, penalties are not. So courts have drawn this line and they, they say that impermissible provisions are those that seek to penalize a contractor for breaching, seek to encourage a contractor to perform to avoid the penalty, or that are just so excessive um, or that far exceed, exceed any actual damages. Any types of clauses that fall into those three categories will likely be deemed as an unenforceable penalty that courts will not enforce. So to make an NLD enforceable, what, what it has to be is, in it, and I, I included this language from the, this case, this Wasserman case, because I think it very succinctly explains it. A liquidated damage to be enforceable needs to be a reasonable forecast of the just compensation for the harm that is caused by the breach. So it's essentially just a forecast of what um, harm could occur to the non-breaching party. Can stipulated some provisions be challenged? Yes, absolutely. And we're going to go through three bases that um, come up very often in construction um, and, and in which we have um, and I have been involved in cases with these challenges. So the three bases first is the status of the project. And when I say that, it means um, how the completion status. Is it substantially complete or not? Um, the number two is that the owner never actually assessed its its actual damages um, and, and the liquidated damage is then not a reasonable forecast um, using the language from that Washerman case that we just talked about. And then the third is that the LD provision is just clearly excessive um, or in fact that it's a provision when there are no actual damages, uh, it, in which case um, that also would not be enforced by the courts. So these are the three, three kind of methods of attack for an LD provision. One thing I wanted to make sure we address is, is the burden of proof. And that's a big thing when we're talking about litigating or arbitrating, um, because it means who has to bring the evidence and really um, prove their case um, before they can prevail. And so in the majority view, which in the majority of states, they say it's the party challenging a liquidated damage provision. They have the burden. So they're going to take the liquidated provision, damage provision, and they're going to enforce it. Those states, those courts in those states will enforce it unless there is an uh, appropriate challenge. Um, so that's New Jersey, Delaware, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and then California in non-consumer transactions. Uh, in the minority view, which includes Pennsylvania, which is where I'm based, they um, say it's the opposite. They say it's the party that's seeking to enforce the stipulated damage. They're the ones who are going to have to prove, and they have the burden to prove, that they reasonably forecast their damages when they set the liquidated damage amount. Okay, so the first argument that you have against liquidated damage is the status of the project. Are LDs being assessed after the project achieves substantial completion? What do we mean by that, substantial completion? I know that a lot of contracts define it, but generally speaking, what we mean is, can the project or work be used? Can it be used for its intended purpose? Has the owner taken occupancy? If you're talking about a ground up construction or renovation, is the owner in the building? Um, if you're talking about 
uh, a road, um, a new new paving, uh, is the road open? Is, is traffic on it? Um, those are kind of the questions. And, and if so, and the LDs are still being assessed despite the fact that the owner is using the work, it's probably a penalty. In almost all cases, it would be a penalty. The reason for that, so why are LDs after a project is substantially completed a penalty? Um, so this is from another New Jersey case, the Supreme Court of New Jersey, and they explained that the rationale is that the liquidated damages would become a penalty because the LDs are supposed to be an approximate of the owner's loss before occupancy. So it is essentially assumed that that LD amount is compensating an owner for the fact that they can't use the new work. Um, they can't occupy the new house that was being built or the new uh, commercial building. They can't get a tenant in there. Um, and that's part of, or that's, that's the main reason that they're being compensated. So that's why anything after substantial completion would be a penalty. The second uh, basis for a challenge uh, that we see, and this is, this is probably the most common, is that uh, owners don't actually do an assessment of actual damages. So what I mean by this is because the stipulated sum must be a reasonable forecast of just compensation for the harm that is caused by the breach, that means that the party that wants to assert that LD had to do some sort of assessment or estimate of what it would actually be harmed if that breach occurred. It's just, and, and the court has made this logic tie that if you, you can't say that uh, $1,000 a day, if that's the LD amount in a contract, is a reasonable forecast if you have no idea what your actual damages would be because you never thought about it or tried to figure it out. So what does that mean for contractors um, that complete late? That means that the owner had to identify what possible damages it would occur for a late finish. And they had to compare that to the LD amount. And I can tell you that this is very common. Whenever we have a, a case that involves liquidated damages, we always seek discovery on this, ask for documents regarding any assessment or analysis done by the owner. Um, and then we always ask deposition questions. And more times than not, there is nothing. There was no analysis done, which then makes it ripe for some sort of motion practice to try and kick the LDs out of the case and deem them unenforceable. So when you're doing that assessment, if an owner is doing that assessment, the question becomes, when do they have to do it? Um, do they have to do it when at the time they contract or before they sign the contract? Um, can they do it once the breach happens? Can they do it once they know, once the contractor has gone past their um, completion date, could they do it then um, or, or both? Um, and, and that depends on the state, it really does. So New Jersey, for example, says you can do it at either time. Um, Pennsylvania says it has to be done prior to entering into the contract, that assessment by the owner. Otherwise it's a penalty. So we recommend it's the safest time to do that would be at the time before you sign the contract to make sure you do that assessment and that there's an, a correlation and, and the LD is set based off that assessment. So I wanted to go through a couple of examples. Um, and this is this is from actual cases and specifications. So this is a bridge case. There's a bridge, new bridge that was being built by a uh, public entity. And uh, our client was awarded the contract to build a new bridge. And this is the LD spec that was in, in that was actually in the contract. So as you can tell, it's only based off of it sets the liquidated damage amount solely based off the original contract amount. Our client's contract was about 30 million. So that meant that they were um, liable for either uh, 1,880 for calendar day or 2,600 for working day, which in this case, um, working days is how the, the, uh, the parties had, had been calculating days. So $2,600 per working day uh, was the liquidated damage amount. And they were being assessed um, for, I believe, over a year. So what are some of the problems with a clause like this? Well, we asked when we looked at it, did the owner determine possible cost per delay on this project? No, absolutely not. They didn't. 
um, because it's only based off of the contract value. Um, then the question was, well, did the owner even determine possible costs per contract level? Um, and, and that was the argument. Indeed, a uh, $1,000 contract um, that is delayed is likely going to have a smaller uh, damage than a $5 million contract that is delayed um, because of the difference in costs that an owner incurs to do that construction work. Um, so that was kind of the question was posed, but when you looked at that and, and the discovery showed that no, they didn't do that. They didn't actually do any analysis when setting, let me go back to it, when setting these contract amounts, um, it was arbitrary. So uh, the question then is, is the LD amount reasonable compared to the actual damages at the time of the breach? Maybe, but that's not enough. Um, the assessment has to be done um, in many states prior to contracting, as I talked about. So the because there was no analysis done uh, by the owner as to what costs would be incurred if the project ran late, that LD clause is unenforceable um, because it, it's essentially arbitrary and the court will view that as a penalty. How could the owner have made it more likely in this case that an LD would be enforced? Um, this was based off a question that I got ahead of time um, and, and I wanted to make sure I addressed it. So uh, in this case, for example, this is a bridge. It did not, it was not a toll bridge. So there was no revenue stream. And a lot of, a lot of buildings don't necessarily have a revenue stream. Um, so, so this is something that comes up. So what other impacts would be incurred from late construction? That's the question that the owner had to ask. Well, in this case, it was they had a construction manager under contract. Um, probably extended design services since most design contracts for construction administration only go for a certain amount of time. Um, insurance, absolutely. Maybe financing costs, that's something that, that happens. Um, so essentially what the owner would have had to do was before it put the contract out for a bid, they needed to look at um, the uh, their contracts for their CM, for their design, and for their insurance, and figure out a daily rate, essentially. They need to figure out what a daily rate would be to do all of those things, um, and then base the LD off on that. And, and if you remember, the law said that it has to be a reasonable forecast. So we're not talking about uh, certainty down to the penny or even down to the dollar. Um, it just has to be a reasonable forecast. Uh, and, and so what I suggest for owners, um, and we represent owners, contractors, um, so we see this on all sides, is to calculate, to do that analysis, um, figure out what the daily rate is, and put a memo to the project file with the calculation and the source documents that, are, that you look at. Um, and that certainly can be done, and that's the best way to defend liquidated damage provision, is to try and figure out what that assessment is prior to putting the contract out on the street. So I'm gonna go back to this provision um, because it, it raised another issue that we dealt with um, and, and we litigated this, this precise issue. So if you, again, um, I wanted to point out this. So it's a schedule of liquidated damages for each day of overrun in contract time. Why is this a problem? Well, as I talked about in the first kind of grounds for attack, contract time means final completion. So it was set, it was assessing LDs based on my client's contract of $2,600 per workday through final completion. Well, that was a problem because the LDs uh, was that they were being assessed after the owner had beneficial use. The bridge was open, traffic was running on it, but LDs were still being assessed. And uh, based on um, the case law, that is not permissible, permissible. Now, you've probably seen contracts where they set a certain LD amount prior to substantial completion, maybe $1,000 a day prior to substantial completion, and then it drops down to $500 a day between substantial completion and final completion. You might be saying, well, doesn't that fix it? 
And I would say no. The owner's point of view is going to say, I'm still incurring costs until the project is fully complete. I still have engineering, construction management, insurance, all these costs until contractor, you're fully off the project. Um, I think this is still problematic because when you think about the, again, that the LD is supposed to be a reasonable forecast of actual damages at some point, um, and, and that the LD amount can't be excessive, at some point that, L, that number prior to final completion, the $500 a day becomes excessive. And, and you can think of scenarios um, that easily kind of show why that's the case. Um, for example, if you had a, um, a contract that was uh, substantially completed in December um, on the punch list, the contractor had to plant two trees. Well, where I am in Philadelphia, plantings normally can't occur until mid-March. So if all the contractor has to do is plant two trees, the construction manager is not sitting out there every day staring at the walls. Everybody's moved on. Um, except for this planting of two trees, which, which will get done. Um, but it would be, the, the, the contractor would be able to say that it's excessive even for $500 a day in LDs while they're just waiting for the weather to change. So there's always a point where an LD gets excessive when you're considering um, final completion. So um, I think that's still problematic if even if you reduce the amount. Okay, so this kind of leads into the issue about damages being excessive um, or in this situation when there's no actual damage. So courts will find that a liquidated damage um, that is clearly excessive is unenforceable. And the reason for that is they find it violates public policy. And um, even though parties are free to contract, the court still reads in um, some policy considerations. And, and this is one of them. Um, that policy is also that the law, it discourages windfalls. Nobody should have a clear windfall from the other party's breach. It should, they should only be compensated um, for their actual damages. So a and Consultants versus Barnes, this is a Seventh Circuit federal court case applying Indiana law. And it kind of explains this. So it said the contract between the parties said in the event of a termination of a consultant's contract, prior to the expiration of the four-year term, as a four-year contract, the contract said that the city of Gary, Indiana had to keep paying the administrative fees, even though they, it had been terminated, say, in year one. Um, so the city of Ger Gary terminated the contract and AV consultants, they sued and they were seeking that LD, that administrative fee for the rest of the term. Is this enforceable? No, it's not. And so what the court said was that the consultant would see, receive profit um, plus the value of its services in the administrative fee. And that's because the consultant could sell its services elsewhere since it was not providing them to the city of Gary. So essentially what the court said was that it was clearly disproportionate, that, that enforced that administrate, it was just disproportionate the court then said, okay, AV consultants, I'm not gonna force your liquidated damage provision. I think it's disproportionate to the actual damages, but if you can prove actual damages, go ahead. They could prove zero actual damages. And although they prevailed, they won zero dollars. Um, so another, this is another example I wanted to go through to try and kind of explain some of these ideas that we've just talked about with the three bases for attack. Um, so this is based off a case that I have ongoing right now. Um, there are three, it was a construction project that involved three phases. The contract value was in excess of 115 million um, for all three phases. That was what the estimated contract value would be. Phase two is the uh, contract that my client had and it was just roof and building envelope portion. Um, it was about $11 million. Uh, phase three, the third phase was estimated to be over 100 million. So that was where the vast majority of the work was happening. That was all of the interior, I think in addition, it was a lot of work, was gonna be in that third phase. Um, and all three of these phases, they were not 
let out at the same time. They were, it was, it was truly one, then two, then three, and they were all publicly advertised for, so different contractors could compete for, e for each. Um, so while my client was working, phase three was canceled um, and that was not going to go forward. So my client finishes, the project is, is you know, it's late, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, the substantial completion certificate is issued past the, the what it says in the contract. Um, there's arguments about why it's late, but either way, the client is facing liquidated damages that are being withheld from its payment applications. So we had to deal with this issue. So it goes to litigation um, and we approach the liquidated damage issue. And this is what it says. This is what it says in the, co in the contract. Again, it's based on dollar contract value only and it has amounts. So what was interesting was that over a million dollars, it was $10,000 a day. So that didn't matter whether it was one million dollars, one million and a dollar, or a hundred million dollars, it was still going to be ten thousand dollars a day, which just that doesn't sit right. So, uh, that was something that certainly raised our eyebrows. Um, and so we took discovery on this to, to see how this clause was created, what went into it, if there was any analysis done, and during depositions, it was discussed that there were actually was an analysis done. And this is what the owner said. The owner said their representatives testified that they did estimate costs that would be incurred, um, but it was based off of all three phases if they were delayed. The $115 million contract is what they based their LD amount of $10,000 a day, not just phase two. So we filed a motion for summary judgment and the court ruled in our favor, finding that that was, in a, that was not a reasonable estimate, um, that it was insufficient to prove that $10,000 a day was a reasonable forecast um, and not a penalty when our client's contract was only $11 million and they were basing it off of all three phases of $115 million. Um, so this is another type of stipulated sum. It's, it is for delay, but it's, it's interesting because you see it a lot in highway contracts and I represent a lot of highway contractors um, who face this. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I raised this issue because um, it's a little bit of a nuance on the typical LD for delay. So James Construction Group, LLC versus Louisiana Department of Transportation. The contract was charged $10,000 a day, but they didn't say it was just LD. They said it was for road user costs. Now, what are road user costs? Uh, when a high state highway project is delayed, the DOT seeks damages for third party tax paying vehicle drivers who are inconvenienced by the roadway construction. They're essentially seeking it for traffic um, on behalf of all people that use roads that of work getting done on them on state highways. Um, so that's the, the idea of what a road user cost is. So the contractor sued and they argued that that the road user cost, it wasn't a liquidated damage that was enforceable, it was a penalty. And they said that because they said the department who they contracted with was not getting damage. It was the motoring public, some, some kind of amorphous idea that somebody else was getting damaged. So, and these are the problems that were raised in the case. Um, are these really the DOT's damages? The DOT will not issue payment to road users, right? It's not as though everybody who was driving on that state road that was getting constructed is gonna get a check for $8 or something. Um, the DOT is not gonna be passing on those costs. Um, what about drivers that are from out of state? Out of state, if it's not a toll road, and it's a driver from California, they're not necessarily paying taxes uh, to the Louisiana Department of Transportation. What if there were no actual backups or traffic, if there was no inconvenience? Um, so the argument was essentially that there was, because there was no actual damage that was suffered by the Department of Transportation, it was an unenforceable penalty. Unfortunately, the court and James, they disagreed with the contractor. They said that the Louisiana Department of Transportation made a statutory duty to supervise and regulate roadways. And that kind of part and parcel with that is that meant they would have the authority to enter in an agreement that um, sought to 
uh, limit the road construction um, and limits impacts on traffic. Uh, that makes sense. The part where I think this judge went a little bit off is then he says that that by he that the Department of Transportation could do that by using a liquidated damage as a disincentive for late construction, which is not consistent with most states' uh, notions for liquidated damages and why they're enforceable. Um, so now this case, I have not seen it cited other places. Um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a one-off. I don't know if the issue has been raised, um, but it certainly is an interesting case um, in, the, in the way that the court viewed it. The one thing that I think really helped the Department of Transportation is that they brought in evidence from the Federal Highway Administration Program that the actual daily road user costs um, incurred are actually 21,000. They were only seeking 10. Uh, and and the court found that compelling. Um, either way, um, I think it's a it's a, a case that probably these these road user costs. I know they're in place in New Jersey. I imagine other uh, departments of transportation use them, and I think it's something that is going to continue to be litigated um, because it doesn't necessarily sit with the the long standing case law on what is a liquidated damage. So it's kind of ripe for challenge. Another stipulated sum provision is incentive versus disincentive. So um, you've probably seen this. Uh, sometimes you see it with like early completion. Um, so basically a specification or a contract will set a base level of performance. And if it's um, if the contractor performs better, they'll be paid more money. And if they perform worse, they will have money reduced. So like an early finish incentive, you know, if you if you complete on time by December 31st, then then you get paid your contract value. But if you actually complete by November, um, November 30th, or by Thanksgiving or something, you would be paid more money. Um, that's fairly common. Um, so is this enforceable? And uh, yes, it is. Um, however, for the disincentive. Uh, the court will still use, generally would still use the reasonable forecast of actual damage analysis. They're still going to view disincentives through that same lens of whether this is a reasonable forecast of actual damage rather than just a penalty. And this came up in the Milton Construction Company versus State of Alabama Bama Highway Department. Um, there, the contract already had liquidated damages for late completion, um, but then there was also a disincentive and an incentive provision, the court held that the disincentive was an unenforceable penalty, um, especially given the fact that there was already liquidated damage provision. Um, now, I thought what was fascinating was that the contractor had already accepted the incentives in some respects, but the court said that didn't matter. So, so they could be they were assessed independently of each other. It wasn't it didn't take the entire in, it, it wasn't as though that because the, the contractor had accepted the incentives, that meant that the disincentives were proper. The court viewed them completely separately. Okay, we get this question a lot. Can you get liquidated damages and also get paid actual damages? Generally, no, um, because again, that would violate the principle that uh, Courts are not going to give windfalls um, and contracts should not provide for windfalls. So a non-breaching party who elects liquidated damages may not also recover actual damages. What are the damages if the, damages if the LD clause is found to be unenforceable? Um, so this was raised by the Supreme Court of South Carolina in Foreign Academic and Cultural Exchange Services Inc. versus Trippin. There, the LD provision had been struck down, but they told the plaintiff, foreign academic, um, that they could, if they could prove actual damages, they could recover them. Now, the problem with that is, as we discussed at the beginning, proving actual damages is harder, especially if there's not a process that was put in place to track them. So if the uh, plaintiff had not been uh, anticipating that I have to prove actual damages, it might be harder to do that because it didn't necessarily have a process to, to capture them or identify them. So what if you uh, have an LD provision, they're being assessed, you all of those three bases that we talked about fail. And it seems like it's a proper clause that is based on a reasonable calculation of uh, damages. Um, they're not being assessed. 
uh, after substantial completion and they don't seem excessive. So what next? Do I have to pay them? Well, it depends on the type of delay. So when we talk about delay, and, and I use this graphic because you know time is money, but um, I, I, we talk about delay, uh, we break them into three categories. So a non-excusable delay. This means that the fault lies with the contractor, there's gonna be no compensation, and LDs, they're gonna be assessed. Um, so that's worst case scenario for a contractor. Um, excusable but non-compensable. This means that it's no, but the delay is nobody's fault. Um, and the contractor is going to get more time, but no money, um, so no LDs. So a lot of times weather is in this category, um, extreme weather, things like that. Um, it's, it's not the owner's fault, but, um, and it depends on the contract language, but the contractor should be given an extension of time and they shouldn't be penalized for that. Um, we had a lot, we had this a lot during Hurricane Sandy um, in our region uh, several years ago. Um, a lot of projects were flooded and, and completely shut down for a couple of weeks or months. Um, and, and so we had to deal with those claims and, and, and the contractors were entitled to, to time for that. Um, excusable and compensable delay. Fault lies with the owner um, and the contractor is entitled to be paid. Um, and they also get an extension of time and LDs cannot be assessed. So these are causes of delay. Um, and these kind of fall into all to those buckets, whether it be the owner's fault or the contractors. Um, and it, each one could probably uh, be either party's fault, depending on the circumstances. But these are just some common ones that we see. Um, failure to provide access, we get that when a notice to proceed is not issued timely, um, or even if it's issued, but there's some permanent reason or something. Um, we see that um, certainly unforeseen sub subsurface conditions. Um, design changes, that's a very common one. Failure to have shop drawings and samples prepared, that's probably going to fall on the contractor. But if the shop drawings are not being approved in a timely manner, that can fall on the owner. Um, and when we say owner, we also mean even that's if that's the fault of the designer, that's still attributable to the owner in, in almost all circumstances. Failure to have material and equipment delivered in a timely manner, that absolutely um, is, is something. Now, if it's the contractor's fault, you know, then that's going to be, um, if, if the contractor didn't order it on time or if there's just delays from the supplier, that's probably going to be the contractor's fault. If it happened to be because there was design changes that prompted the need to change a supplier or something like that or order material late because of design changes, then that probably falls onto the owner. Acts of God, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Whether we mentioned strikes, um, that's also kind of something we'll talk about later. Um, cash flow restrictions. Um, you've seen this a lot. If, if it's because the contractor doesn't have the cash flow to do the project, well, then that's something that they're going to have to probably take responsibility for. However, a lot of times, especially with public owners, we see this where the, time, the timing of payments is just extremely exaggerated. And even though uh, the contract provides for longer periods, it's still extended for months. Um, and that can have an effect of slowing down the work. Um, delays by another contractor, that's another common one we see. So how do you notify owners um, or general contractors of delay? So absolutely in writing and promptly. As soon as you see an event, you should put in a notice. Um, it can be an email, um, but just get it in writing and um, make sure that um, it's as prompt as possible. Uh, should your notice identify specific areas? Yeah, if you can. I, you want to be as specific as possible and you can supplement. You can write a general notice and then supplement with more information once you have it. And then should you quantify the day's delay? Yeah, if possible, you really should. Um, you should identify uh, to the extent you can, you should, you should include that. Um, so this is a general notice that we find very helpful um, that I think could be copied um, essentially just a memo um, and, and one, it's a subcontractor to a general contractor and they're saying why they're impacted. And you can see they're saying in this building, the asbestos abatement contractor is in our way. We can't finish our work. Um, missing drywall. So there's tons of, you know, this is helpful. I would add a column actually that has days if you can calculate them. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, especially in a contract with very large liquidated damages, um, this might not be appropriate if you only have $100 a day or something like that, but with very large liquidated damages, if, if the project is slipping, the schedule is slipping, we encourage contractors to bring in a scheduling consultant um, right away during the project if you don't have one in-house. Um, and that's very helpful because they'll allow you to make sure that your schedules are capturing the slippage and identify where it is. Um, and that's going to help with proving the case and hopefully getting a time extension during the project so you don't even have to face fighting LDs. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, COVID-19 um, or the current pandemic and, and delay issues. And what this really raises is the issue of force majeure, which you might have heard um, talked about uh, in the industry. So what is a force majeure? It is the French word for superior force. So it's essentially saying that it's an uncontrollable event, something like war, um, a labor stoppage, uh, earthquakes, really extreme weather, flooding, um, things that are not the fault of any party. No party caused it, could control it, could foresee it. It just happened. And because it happened, it makes it very difficult or impossible to perform the contract as planned or as intended. So there's a couple elements to satisfy the force majeure. Um, so not all events that are outside of a contractor's control um, is going to be a force majeure. It one it has to be outside of it has to be an event that is beyond the control of, of both contracting parties. It can't be anticipated. It's not something that you saw that could or could have seen coming down the road. Um, for example, if you knew that the uh, the building code was going to change and, and it was announced that it was going to change in a couple of months, that wouldn't be unanticipated. You knew it was going to change. It just wasn't necessarily changed at the time you entered in your contract. So it's really got to be something you don't anticipate. Um, it's got to be unavoidable, something that you can't get around. Um, and then again, no party can be the cause of it. So is COVID-19 a force majeure? Simplistically, absolutely it is. It's out of, out of the party's control and it may, and can make it impossible or difficult to perform contracts. Um, and so in assessing this, this is what courts look to. Um, so the, first they're gonna look to the language in the party's contract. That is always the starting point with our disputes is what is the language in the contract? And they're gonna look to the force majeure clause and see what events are anticipated. Then it's going to see, say, whether the event was foreseeable, um, could either party have seen it coming down the road, um, and then did it actually cause non-performance? Did it actually cause somebody to fail to be able to satisfy their contractual obligations? Um, so some force majeure clauses in, use the words pandemic or epidemic, and they're not the same, um, but they, they, some use them, some don't. Some might use one or the other, which could matter, um, and some do not. Uh, so if the clause does not use those words, um, then you kind of have, we have some interpretation that has to be done and courts will do this. So uh, they're gonna look at the clause and does it only involve events such as nature, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, um, things like that. If it's only events pertaining to nature, the court might construe it very narrowly and not consider like a pandemic to be included. The saving thing that many, many, the good part that many clauses use is they use the word act of God. Um, so an act of God is, is much broader. Um, and, I, and I would feel very comfortable arguing that this was an act of God, this, this pandemic and, and, the, and the, all of the effects that it caused, the closures, things like that. Um, so um, it depends on the state court. Some have said that acts of God are, are narrowly construed to still be things arriving from nature. Um, but either way, that's that's going to help you a lot. It has uses a broad term like that. So um, many construction contracts. Um, also, just one note: many construction contracts do not use the term force majeure. Um, I've looked at several Department of Transportation specifications, and it doesn't appear in there. Instead, if you look to the delay or time extension section of those specifications that's where you get language such as acts of God. So essentially it's it's a force majeure clause, but in the close of a delay spec or a time extension spec. Uh, 
So for example, this is the Washington State DOT extension of time um, specification. And it lists all these causes why a contractor could be entitled to an extension of time. It says adverse weather. Well, that doesn't help us with COVID-19, so that's not gonna work. Um, to neglect of the contracting agency. No, the agency didn't cause the pandemic. Um, fire, strikes, nope, none of that works. So if you go down, you eventually get down to number seven and it says exceptional causes that are not identified um, if the contractor have no control and could have nothing done nothing to avoid it or shorten it. And that would be something um, like the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the related uh, effects of it that have impacted the construction industry. Um, so that's where you're going to be able to make your force majeure argument under number seven. Okay, the other thing the court will look at is whether it was foreseeable. And just generally, the pandemic is probably not foreseeable. However, there is a, a little change to that in that now, if you're entering into contracts now, it's going to be harder to say it's not foreseeable. It's still going on. And we know that it's it's not necessarily a, it's it's fluid. It could continue to impact your region, and even if it's not now. So if you're entering into contracts now, you have to be cognizant of what that could mean to your force majeure rights. And actually, the very last slide talks about some drafting suggestions for future contracts. Did it actually prohibit you from performing? Now, this is going to be very fact sensitive. Um, and if, if this did go to litigation, um, this would be something that would, um, you know, require a good amount of discovery on. So you would need to prove how your performance was affected. And that is, so there's some really easy ones. If, if the state or a municipal uh, government entity said construction activity is uh, shut down, to mitigate the spread, then that's gonna be a really easy one. You're just gonna calculate the days or weeks that you were shut down and, and that's gonna be, uh, that should be an extension of time. Um, harder is uh, the case where you might have construction workers that um, some of your crew that are, are sick or they're caring for sick or their kids are out of school or something. Like these are the cases that are gonna be harder and you're really gonna have to show um, what your efforts were to man the project and the, and the unique conditions at the site that made it so that you could not perform because of the pandemic. Other things that we've seen that are a little harder to prove. Um, so for example, if you're an HVAC contractor and you need to get equipment from carrier, well, carrier might have, their production might be slowed because they've had to put in mitigation efforts into their uh, manufacturing facilities. So, you know, you're gonna have, if you have equipment and material delays because your producers and their suppliers are unable to keep the production that it usually did that you, you anticipated when you bid the contract and when you put the order in, um, that's something that you're going to have to prove. Um, I recommend really staying in contact with your uh, your sales reps, things like that, and and getting documentation from the owner so you can then excuse me from the supplier so you can take it to the owner and say, look, this is why I'm not able to get uh, this equipment and this is why the project is being delayed. And the other one that's a little bit harder to prove, but I think is going to be probably one of the more common uh, things that we see is productivity reduced due to job worksite conditions um, that are being imposed by uh, state and municipal entities. So if, if to keep working on a site, you have to follow certain procedures um, and that's going to reduce the number of people you can have on the site or um, staggered shifts or something like that, um, even just increased um, PPE that might make it harder to do the, the job as quickly, um, that's going to be harder to prove, um, but it should be recoverable. Um, it's something that you're going to want to keep in, in, into, you're wanna, excuse me, it's something you're going to want to track if you can, um, because you should be entitled to an extension at a time if it's a force majeure event. So I do have a slide on tracking. So this is, when we talk about tracking delays and cost impacts, um, that's something that we deal with a lot. Um, and, and there's a couple of things to think about. Your daily reports are very helpful in this um, and should be used. Um, so a, a good daily report, it's going to have the uh, people on site, uh, their, what they're doing, um, 
and their their classification. Um, it's going to have the specific area that they're working, which is very helpful. Um, and then you should have an impact section. You should basically be prompting your field supers to really be thinking about was something impacting them. Um, and, and they should record that every day. If you're working on TNM basis, or if you have doing you think you're doing extra or changed work or something, um, or you just have TNM sheets that you're tracking um, for purposes of a claim, um, those should be provided and signed off um, to the extent you can. I know a lot of contracts require that, but it's a good practice. Get it signed off by the owner or GC. That always then prompts the next question is, well, they won't sign, they refuse to sign. And, and, and that's okay. We don't really frankly care because the whole point is to give them a document that says, look, I had these 10 guys on the site today. I had two cranes. This is the amount of time that was being worked. They work from seven to three um, and, and allow them to say, no, that's wrong. And if they don't sign it, they're gonna have a hard, but they were given the opportunity to review it. They're gonna have a hard time refuting that you in fact had the same, those those uh, workers and that equipment being used. Um, so uh, it doesn't really matter if they don't sign it, um, but it, it give it to them. And a good practice is to email it to them. You can, your super can take a picture on their phone and email it the same day um, or upload it the same day um, if, if uh, they're refusing to sign. And then the other big thing with force majeure is notice. Notice is always a thing with construction contracts and any sort of claim. It should be given promptly and, and you can update it once you have more information. A lot of this, you might not know the exact impact it's gonna have. You can put a, uh, somebody on notice. I think I'm gonna have delays because this equipment is being delayed, um, but I don't have an estimated timetable yet. And then once you get that timetable, you can update it. So this is, um, I mentioned this, so if, for future contracts, um, here's some best practices for how to deal with um, the pandemic. So you're gonna wanna make sure that your force majeure clause specifically has the words pandemic, epidemic included in the types of events that are listed. So when it says earthquake, hurricane, flooding, include pandemic and epidemic. Then you also wanna go one step further and say, COVID-19 pandemic. And the reason for that is because if it's not specifically listed, the other side will always argue that it's not anticipated, right? They're just gonna say it's not anticipated because you entered into the contract while it was ongoing. Um, so I would, I would include those words in your list of force majeure events. Um, also, good practice, avoid no damage for no light clauses. Or if you have to agree to one, limit it. You could limit it such that if the no damage for delay doesn't apply to force majeure. Um, there's ways to kind of limit its applicability and make a more fair bargain. So um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. And um, otherwise, I thank you so much for uh, attending and um, I hope it provided some helpful information um, or uh, my contact information is on the screen. You're welcome to email me um, any other questions you have as well.